Um, okay, I'm gonna just go ahead. So I'm Lourdes, I am a patient advocate with the Clangio Carcinoma Foundation, and I am very happy to have Amanda Goodstadt here with us today to talk about minimizing the financial impact of the cancer diagnosis. Uh, Amanda Goodstadt is a staff attorney with Triage Can Cancer, where she works on the legal and financial navigation program, presents educational programming, and helps develop resources for use in the cancer community. Prior to joining Triage Cancer, she spent more than a decade counseling seniors and caregivers about Medicare and related benefits. So we wanna welcome Amanda. And as a reminder, um, she is not able to address your personal situation. So we ask that you please keep your questions more general and to put them in the um, Q&A section for us. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Amanda. Thank you so much, Lourdes. And thank you all for being here this afternoon um, to talk a little bit about minimizing the financial impact of a cancer diagnosis. So for those of you who are not familiar with triage cancer, we are a national nonprofit that provides free education on legal and practical issues that can impact people who've been diagnosed with cancer and their caregivers. And we're really proud of the fact that all the services we provide are free of charge because we strongly believe that someone's financial circumstances should not be a barrier to getting important information. We provide education in a lot of different ways. We have a very robust website where you can find out a lot more about today's subject matter, as well as about so many of the different legal and financial issues that can arise as a result of a diagnosis. You'll find information there about various educational events that we host, like our free one-day conference and our webinar series, as well as about events we participate in that are hosted by our partners in the cancer community. This is also where you can download copies of our resources. Um, you see pictures of some of the popular ones. We have a lot of quick guides, which are fact sheets, introducing or summarizing important topics, a lot of checklists and worksheets to keep you organized. Our website is also where you can access our animated videos, our recorded webinars, um, and even access our podcast. So I hope you'll check it out. I have sent Lourdes a document, a resource document that I created for today's webinar. And so if you see links on any of my slides to specific resources, or you hear me mention them, those are all pulled together in that resource document. So now that I told you a little bit about triage cancer, let's get into today's subject. So I think most of us are used to, uh, at this point, hearing about the physical toxicity that is associated with cancer, whether that is environmental toxins that may be linked to causing cancer or the toxic impact on our bodies of some of the treatments that are effective in fighting cancer. Just as there is this physical toxicity, there is unfortunately financial toxicity, the negative financial side effects that are caused or exacerbated by a diagnosis. Financial toxicity can be every bit as significant as physical toxicity. And in addition to impacting the individual who's been diagnosed, it can have a significant impact on their loved ones. So there are certainly a number of factors that impact anyone's overall financial health. But the one that we at Triage Cancer think is the most significant contributor, excuse me, to financial toxicity is health insurance status. Are you covered adequately by your health insurance? Even if you are, do you know how to use your health insurance effectively in order to minimize costs? We have found that the primary way to mitigate financial toxicity is to make sure that you are using your health insurance properly. And so I'm going to take the lion's share of today's time to talk about that. Um, however, I will speak at the end about some of the other factors. Um, you can see them on the slide, things like employment changes or other life changes that may also influence financial health. So if we know that health insurance status is the most significant contributor to financial toxicity, in theory, it seems like it should be an easy problem to solve. However, one of the challenges when we talk about health insurance in this country is that it's such a complicated subject that a lot of Americans don't understand how it works or how to select a plan that can work for them. 
In fact, in this survey, 96% of the people who were surveyed could not define four basic terms that are used across all types of health insurance to describe cost. So if you've always been wondering about what certain terms mean, or you've been confused by some of the things you're reading, I want you to know that you are not alone. And it's my hope that after we talk today, you will feel more confident about your ability to understand these topics or these terms and to select the difference um, that is right for you. So let's start off with these basic terms that most people don't know how to define. These are all terms that deal with the cost of health insurance. And these terms are used regardless of how you get your health insurance, whether you have a plan through an employer or a plan purchased on the marketplace, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. So the first of these terms is premium, and that is your cost just to have health insurance. It is a fixed dollar amount you are paying each month to have that insurance, whether you never see a doctor or whether you are seeing multiple doctors multiple times each month. Then you have costs when you actually start using your health insurance. The first of those is the deductible. Again, this is a fixed dollar amount that you are paying out of your own pocket each year before your insurance starts to share in your costs. Deductibles vary by plan. There are plans that have very high deductibles. There are other plans that have zero deductibles. They start sharing in costs on day one. To know what your deductible is, you have to look at your plan. Then there's a cost each time you actually go and get healthcare, each time you visit a doctor, each time you fill a prescription. And that cost can be expressed in one of two ways, either as a fixed dollar amount, in which case it's called a copayment, or as a percentage, in which case it's called a coinsurance or a cost share. So if every time I go to my primary care physician, I pay $20, that's a copayment. If every time I go to my primary care physician, I pay 20% of the cost of the visit, that's a coinsurance or a cost share. The final term I want to make sure we all understand when it comes to cost is out-of-pocket maxima. This is, again, a fixed dollar amount, and it represents the most that you're going to pay out of your own pocket for your covered medical expenses during the year. Once you reach your plan's out-of-pocket maximum, your plan takes over and pays 100% of covered expenses. When it comes to knowing what your plan's out-of-pocket maximum is and how it is calculated, you have to look at the kind of plan you have and at the terms of the plan. So just as an example, if you purchase a health insurance plan on the marketplace, then out-of-pocket maximum represents the sum of what you have paid towards your deductible, co-pays, and co-insurances. Once you have reached the, um, the set amount, you have satisfied that out-of-pocket maximum. So I want to just do a quick review of how this works and give you an example. So meet Dan. Dan purchases an individual health insurance plan on his state's marketplace. It has a $2,000 deductible. It's structured as an 80-20 coinsurance plan. Plan pays 80%, individual pays 20. And it has an $8,000 out-of-pocket max. Dan ends up in the hospital with an enormous $102,000 bill. What is he going to have to pay? So the first $2,000 of his bill, he has to pay. That's his deductible. And that leaves him with $100,000. His coinsurance is 20%, 20% of 100,000, 20,000. That's not the end of Dan's story. Because he has an out-of-pocket maximum of $8,000, he's already paid $2,000 towards that, $6,000 remains, and that's all he needs to pay out of that remaining 20,000. Now, he's paid a total of $8,000 out-of-pocket. I am not trying to suggest that that is not a lot of money. Of course it is but it's a lot less money than 20,000, let alone 102,000. So if you are interested in hearing that example again, or you have someone in your life who you think could benefit from hearing it, um, it is all in one of our animated videos about health insurance basics. A couple of nuances to out-of-pocket maximums. The first is, 
when I talked about Dan, I said he had purchased an individual health insurance plan. Of course, many people have family health insurance plans. So if you have a family plan, be aware that there may be individual out-of-pocket maximums for each of the people covered by the plan, as well as a family out-of-pocket maximum. Another nuance, I mentioned that Dan bought his plan on the marketplace. And as I said earlier, health insurance plans purchased on the marketplace define out-of-pocket maximum as any amounts that have been paid for deductibles, co-payments, and coinsurances for both medical care and prescription drugs. That's the marketplace plan definition, but employer plans don't necessarily have that same definition. So some employer plans might not include your deductible. It might be that you have to satisfy your deductible and then separately for out-of-pocket maximum, the plan only looks at what you've paid towards co-payments or coinsurances. An employer-sponsored plan might not even include co-payments. They might only look at amounts paid towards co-insurances when determining if you've satisfied your out-of-pocket maximum. And employer plans may not include amounts you spend on prescription drugs. It is very possible that a plan could have a separate out-of-pocket maximum for healthcare than it does for prescription drugs. There can also be a separate out-of-pocket maximum for out-of-network services which brings me to one more set of terms I want people to be aware of. So for most health insurance policies, they have, <clears throat> pardon me, they have networks of providers that they have contracted with to provide services to the people who have that insurance at set rates. The providers can be doctors or groups of doctors, hospitals, labs, um, therapists, even pharmacies. If you go to a provider who is in your plan's network, you are paying the contracted amount or the allowed amount that the provider has pre-agreed to with that provider. Or I'm sorry, the insurance plan has agreed to with that provider for particular services. Now, some health insurance plans will not offer any coverage if you go out of network. They only contribute to the cost of services that you get from in-network providers. Other plans will provide coverage when you go out of network, but at completely different and usually higher rates. So it's very important to know whether the providers you are seeing are in network for your plan. So that covers some basic terms. Um, and all those terms are regardless to, are important to know regardless of where you're getting your health insurance. But I think it's useful to take a step back and just remind everybody about what the options are for where you could be getting health insurance. There are three main places in the United States that people look to for health insurance. The first of those, the bottom of my pyramid here, is an employer. This could be through your own employer, it could be through your spouse's employer, or depending upon your age, a parent's employer. This could also refer to COBRA continuation coverage. So you used to work for an employer, you're continuing on with the same or substantially similar health insurance, even though you're no longer actively employed. And under employer, I also put retiree coverage, because again, that coverage is associated with and sponsored by a former employer or perhaps a union. The second major place that Americans get their health insurance from is the government. And this level includes things like Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Administration and military policies, the Indian Health Service, and some state high-risk pools. The third place Americans get their health insurance is directly from an insurance company. And state marketplaces fall on this level. Even though those marketplaces are regulated by the government, when you purchase a plan on them, you are purchasing directly from a private insurance company. So at Triage Cancer, we believe that it's important that you know about all of your health insurance options so that you can choose the one that works best for you. A lot of people don't realize that they have options. They might only know about one of them. They might think they're limited to just an employer's, um, an employer sponsored policy. So I don't really have time today to get into the ins and outs of all of these options, but I do want you to know that we have a lot of resources to help you understand things like COBRA and the marketplace and Medicare and Medicaid. 
Um, in particular, I wanna point out that we did two webinars earlier this fall, one in September that was an in-depth look at Medicare and one in October where we went into a deeper dive about the marketplace and about Medicaid. So if those are topics that are of interest to you, you might wanna check them out. In addition to knowing what options you have, it's important to know when you can take advantage of an option. When can you enroll or when can you make a change to how you get your coverage? So if you have an employer-sponsored plan, your enrollment period is gonna vary. Oftentimes it's in the fall, but not always. So it's a question to ask of your human resources department or whoever handles um, benefits at your employer. If you have Medicaid or you think you are eligible for Medicaid and need Medicaid coverage, Medicaid takes applications all year round. Whenever you think you need it, you can apply. Medicare has an annual fall open enrollment period. We're actually in that open enrollment period right now. It started on October 15th. It goes through December 7th, <clears throat> pardon me. And during this open enrollment period, if you have Medicare, you can make changes to how you get that coverage. And a change made now will become effective for a calendar year 2023 on January 1st. The marketplace also has a fall open enrollment period, and we are also in the middle of that. The general open enrollment period is November 1st through January 15th. Although if you want your coverage to begin on January 1st, you need to enroll before or or by December 15th, so that the coverage starts on the first of the year. Be aware that depending on where you live, you may have a slightly different or longer open enrollment period. So it's important to check um, with your state's marketplace to see if the dates are the same or a little different from the federal open enrollment period. Now, once you narrow down your plan options and you know when you can enroll or make a change, you need to know how to compare your options. So I wanna walk you through an exercise to do this. The exercise is going to use um, or compare three marketplace plans, but really you can do the same thing and compare an employer plan you're offered with an employer plan your spouse is offered. You could compare a marketplace plan to an employer sponsored plan. You can even do this to compare two Medicare Advantage plans. So the concepts are the same even if um, actually going and doing it is slightly different depending upon the type of insurance. So let's take three plans here. Um, for those of you familiar with the marketplace, you'll know that they uh, categorize their plans using the colors of metals. So we have a bronze plan with a $200 monthly premium, $6,000 deductible and $8,000 out-of-pocket maximum, a silver plan with a $275 monthly premium, $2,500 deductible, and $6,000 out-of-pocket maximum, and a platinum plan that gives me a little bit of sticker shock with a $400 monthly premium, no deductible, and a $2,000 out-of-pocket maximum. Our goal in comparing plans based on cost is to figure out which plan is likely to cost the least in total for the year. And we're gonna assume, since we're talking about someone with a cancer diagnosis, that they're gonna actually be using a lot of healthcare and that they are going to hit their out-of-pocket maximum. So the question is, just by looking, can we tell right away, the same way we could tell at a store if we're looking at two price tags, which of these is the least expensive option? So the answer is we can't tell just by looking. We actually have to do some math. Remember, our goal is selecting the plan with the lowest total cost for the year. So in order to do that, when we do our math, we have to take our monthly premium, multiply it by 12, because that's a fixed cost. We know we have it no matter what. And then we have to add the out-of-pocket maximum to the total cost of 12 months worth of premium. So when we do that, our bronze plan totals out at $10,400 our silver plan at $9,300, and our platinum plan with the super high monthly premium that's double the premium of the bronze plan ends up totaling at $6,800. 
a $3,600 savings over that bronze plan. I have found in my work um, counseling people about making health insurance selections that a lot of people focus primarily on premiums. And I understand the desire to do that. A premium's a fixed cost, you know you're gonna pay it each month, but premiums only tell part of the story. If you remember back on the slide where we talked about um, the terms that a lot of people can't define, Premium is only one of several terms related to the cost of insurance. So it is very important to do this math and to not only look at one element of cost, but to look at all of the elements in total. Now comparing cost is only one step of comparing health insurance plans. Step two is comparing networks of providers and facilities and checking to make sure that any doctors that you want to see or facilities where you want to be treated are covered by the plan you choose. The third main point to compare among plans is prescription drug coverage. Are the drugs you take covered or on the plan's formulary? Even if they're on a plan's formulary, are there any restrictions on getting those drugs? things like prior authorization that could be required, having to go back to an insurance company before getting a prescription filled and getting permission for the drug, or step therapy, being required to demonstrate to the plan that you have tried a lower cost drug to treat the same thing without success. And also, if the drugs are in fact on the plan's formulary, at what price are they at an affordable cost for you? So there are a couple of ways to see what providers are part of a plan or what drugs are covered. If you're looking at marketplace plans, the marketplace website makes this um, somewhat easy for you to do. You can enter in specific names of doctors or facilities and specific names of prescription drugs in which you're interested, and you'll be able to see which plans include those um, providers or those drugs and which do not couple of suggestions when doing this. Always double check with your providers. Always make sure if you are looking online to get information that you are double checking that the online site that you're looking at has been updated properly. Always search using specific plan names. Certainly, um, you don't want to do something like use Obamacare, um, but it also is not going to be helpful to use the name of an insurance company alone. Like if you search Blue Cross, Blue Cross is going to have hundreds of different plans. So it's very important when you're searching or calling a provider and asking that you use the full name of the plan you're considering. Um, and if possible, if there's any coding information with that, sometimes there's a series of letters or numbers that you use that as well. You can definitely check provider websites. Um, many of them, certainly big hospitals, will have lists of which insurance plans they accept. And make sure to let your providers know if you are switching insurance at the end of the year so that they can try and smooth out that transition and reduce billing errors. It can feel like selecting the right plan is easier said than done. This is so important to your finances that we have created a few resources just around this concept. So the information I talked about is in an animated video about picking health insurance plans. And we also created a worksheet that you can see here and download from our website um, where you can kind of just fill in the blanks with the um, dollar figures that you collect about different plans and it will walk you through doing the math to easily compare plans. Also know that unfortunately choosing a health insurance plan is not a one and done exercise. It's really important to continually review your coverage at least once each year. Your circumstances may change. For example, you might switch jobs or retire. Your health situation could change. You might go from a period of time where you didn't need a lot of treatment to all of a sudden needing it. But even if your circumstances remain the same and your health situation remains stable, even if you're keeping the same insurance from year to year, the cost of that insurance and the coverage terms can be changed from year to year. If you feel like you need some support in comparing plans, there are people who are out there who can help. 
Um, a lot of people ask me about using insurance agents or brokers, and certainly insurance agents and brokers can be very knowledgeable on this subject, but be aware that they have a financial interest in the selections that you make. And so an alternative, for example, if you are looking at marketplace plans, is to use a marketplace assister. These are people who are trained and certified and required to provide objective information. They have no financial interest in the decisions you make. And you can locate them by using um, the Marketplace website and searching by zip code. I also want to just say um, a couple of words about Medicare. Medicare is a big subject to try and tackle in a short time. So I'm going to try and really do it very quickly. But we are in the middle of Medicare's open enrollment period when you can make changes to how you get your Medicare, like switching from original Medicare to an Advantage plan or switching Advantage plans or drug plans. There are two main options people have when it comes to Medicare. Um, they're pictured here as um, lanes to drive down. So the first lane is what we call original Medicare. That is using Medicare Part A for <clears throat> pardon me, hospital and other inpatient coverage, Medicare Part B for what we're calling here medical insurance, which is doctor's visits, lab, tests, therapy, other outpatient items. Um, in addition, if you want prescription drug coverage, you need to purchase a separate standalone Medicare Part D plan from a private insurance company. The last option you have in lane one, because original Medicare, Medicare Parts A and B, do not have an out-of-pocket maximum, you have the option, if you want some help with those out-of-pocket costs that Medicare doesn't cover, you can choose to purchase a separate Medicare Supplemental Insurance Plan or a Medigap. Again, plans offered by private insurance companies. That is lane one of Medicare. The alternative is lane two, which is Medicare Advantage, also called Medicare Part C. These are private managed care plans through which people choose to get their Medicare benefits. So if you choose an Advantage plan, you are getting your hospital and inpatient coverage and your medical coverage all through that private managed care plan. Most of those plans offer drug coverage. If you happen to choose a Part C plan that does not, you are also allowed to select a separate Medicare Part D plan. What you can't do in lane two is purchase a Medigap. And that is because Medicare Advantage plans must have stated out of pocket maximums. So I just gave you a bunch of information in about a minute that took about an hour and a half in our September webinar. And so um, there is a lot more that can be said about Medicare, but I wanted to just sort of give you that overview. We have a special Medicare com plan comparison worksheet we created. It's similar to the worksheet I showed you earlier um, for non-Medicare plans. There are some nuances to Medicare that make this a little bit different. We also have a brand new resource hub about Medicare on our website that has a lot of resources specific to this very complicated program. So at this point, I talked about comparing plan options and by doing so, hopefully you get to select a plan that's going to work well for you for the year. But the reality is even having adequate health insurance isn't going to completely eliminate your medical bills. So I'm gonna talk about some strategies for managing those. Um, when you get your health care, it usually triggers a flurry of communications, some of which are from your insurance company. The most important of those is the explanation of benefits, or EOB. The um, notice that you get from your insurance company that explains what a health care provider has billed them for, what they're going to pay, and what they think you may owe out of pocket. This is an illustration of the types of information you should be able to find on an EOB. Um, most importantly, you will see this is not a bill written somewhere on it. That's how you know it's an EOB. You'll have basic information about who the policyholder is and who the patient was and claim numbers. You'll have a summary of what was billed, what the insurance company has approved, and what the insurance company thinks you may owe. And then you'll have some breakdown and detail, things like um, the type of procedure and the coding for it a breakdown of what was approved and allowed and paid, 
as well as a breakdown of how your portion may be allocated, including whether anything was applied to your deductible. Finally, in a good EOB, there'll be a marker somewhere to show you where you are following the processing of this claim in terms of satisfying your deductible and your out-of-pocket maximum. Just like your insurance company communicates with you about bills, your provider does too. They're sending you the bill. Unfortunately, the bill often comes sooner than the EOB. We encourage you to try and wait for EOBs before you pay any bills, match them up, and communicate with your provider. If you're holding on to something and not paying because you're waiting for the EOB, that's understandable, let them know. It's really important to review bills for accuracy and to ask for clarification on things you don't understand or that don't seem to make sense. It's important to review the EOBs. If you're not feeling up to doing that, it can be a great task to give to a family member or a friend who has been asking you, what can I do to help out? There are professional bill reviewing organizations if you are unable to do this for yourself and there's no one close to you who you might be able to ask for help. Also remember, you can appeal denials of coverage. Um, we find that the vast majority of people, for whatever reason, they, um, they just accept it if an insurance company issues a denial. We try to encourage people not to take no for an answer. Um, because besides understanding all the terms I talked about and making the best choices you can, another way to make sure you're effectively using your health insurance is to appeal denials. Um, appeals is a complicated topic. Um, as a starting point, it's, it's important to know what kind of insurance you have. There are different appeals processes depending upon um, if you have an individual plan, an employer-sponsored plan, Medicare, Medicaid, it's important to find out the reason for a denial. Sometimes claims are denied for administrative reasons like coding errors. Sometimes though, insurers are questioning whether things are medically necessary. And if that's the case, getting your healthcare provider involved with your appeal can be critical to success. We have a lot of resources on our website to help walk you through the appeals process. I also wanna point out one um, pretty new resource we created a medical bill tracker. It's downloadable um, as a Google Sheet on our website. And using this medical bill tracker, you can put in the specifics of your deductible, your out-of-pocket maximum. And then as you receive bills, if you put that information into the worksheet down below, it will automatically calculate for you what is remaining to meeting your deductible or out-of-pocket maximum. So this can be useful if your EOB does not track this information for you. Um, there is some good news about medical collection debt that came out this year, earlier this year, um, effective as of July 1st. Paid medical collection debt no longer is included on credit reports, and also the time period before unpaid medical collection debt appears on credit reports increased from six months to a year. And effective in the first half of next year, um, certain medical collection debt amounts won't even be on credit reports from the three big credit reporting agencies at all. It is said that this action by the credit agencies is going to remove nearly 70% of medical debt in collections accounts from people's credit reports. So it's a great consumer-friendly step. Fact is, even if someone does their very best to select adequate health insurance and utilizes all these great strategies, it's still possible, of course, that people are not going to have enough um, in terms of money. I do want to um, reference one of the tools on our website is cancerfinances.org, where we have modules about a lot of different topics that can impact your finances. But in particular, two of the really popular ones are our financial assistance resources module and our managing prescription drug cost module, um, where we <clears throat> provide links to information about many private sources of grant money. Um, we also have a partnership with another nonprofit called Needy Meds. They um, have a wonderful network at a lot of pharmacies nationwide that provides discounts on um, lots of drugs. Of course, not every drug is part of their network. However, um, having this card, which is not a um, personal card, it doesn't require registration or a name, but it allows you a reminder to ask your pharmacist if they have tips also on reducing drug costs. 
So in the couple of minutes I have um, remaining, even though I focused so far on strategies around health insurance, I did want to address or say at least a few things about some of the other um, topics that can influence financial health or financial toxicity. Um, so one of those is someone's employment status. People, of course, make a lot of different decisions about how to handle their jobs in light of a cancer diagnosis and in light of how treatment is impacting them. There are those who would like to continue working to the fullest extent possible. Some people, however, might want time off. Others may decide to retire entirely. Regardless of the decision someone ultimately makes, we think it's really important to understand what your options are. And there are a few places to go to see what those options might be and what rights we have as employees. One of those is just the body of employment laws that can apply. There are laws that exist at the federal level, meaning they apply in all 50 states. There are also laws at each state's level, and sometimes there are even local laws. There are two major types of laws we look to in the employment context. The first of those is fair employment laws. These are the laws that protect people against discrimination in the workplace based on their medical condition, and they give people access to what are called reasonable accommodations. At the federal level, these law, the, the law, primary law that we're talking about is the Americans with Disabilities Act, although there is also the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 if you work for the federal government. Um, and then of course there are state and sometimes local laws as well. Besides fair employment laws, we have leave laws. These are the laws that allow you to take time off from work and provide some job protection and sometimes even some health insurance protection. The main federal leave law that people talk about is the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, although again, many states also have leave laws. In addition to all these laws, another place to find out the rights you may have in your workplace is an employment agreement. So sometimes people have individual employment agreements, but also know that if you are a union member, that your union's collective bargaining agreement is your employment contract. And it's place to see what benefits you may have by virtue of being a union member and whether certain benefits might not apply to you as a union member. It's also important to remember that laws just provide the bare minimum of benefits that employers are required to give their employees. There are actually a lot of employers out there who provide benefits that are better than the bare minimum. So where do you go to find out about that? You have to look to your employer's policies. This might mean an actual physical employee handbook or an employee manual. Um, increasingly these days, it may look like uh, an employee portal that you have to access using a password or employee ID. Some companies won't have a big manual that's all pulled together, but you might have to look at a series of separate policies or procedures that you've collected from different places. If you can't find anything on your own, the place to go to learn more would be your human resources person or whoever handles benefits for your organization. When it comes to employee benefits, you could be looking at things like insurance, whether it's health insurance, short or long-term disability insurance, even life insurance. There may be other benefits you have access to, like sick time, vacation time, other paid time off. Some companies allow for colleagues to donate hours to one another. Some have flex time opportunities or job sharing. Um, some even offer employee assistance programs or financial counseling. The other thing you may be able to find in your employer policies is whether your employer has laid out a specific process for requesting a medical leave or a reasonable accommodation. Not all employers do, but if your employer has a process, it's really important to follow it. Now, depending on someone's situation, they may eventually realize that they just are unable to work. In these instances, disability insurance can provide you with some income because you are unable to work due to your medical condition. The rationale is that it is replacing some or all of the income you would otherwise be earning if you were able to work. There are a number of sources of disability insurance. Um, the first option is private disability insurance, which means you either purchased it on your own as an individual directly from an insurance company, or more likely, 
it was purchased through your employer and is being provided as an employee benefit, and your employer pays all or at least part of your premiums. Disability insurance is categorized as either short-term or long-term. Short-term is for disabilities that are expected to last, generally speaking, less than a year, and long-term is for disabilities expected to last for a year or more. Second place people can look for disability insurance is their state. There are a handful of states only that offer short-term disability benefits. They're listed on the slide, and each of those states' programs is going to be different in terms of how long a benefit is available, what the eligibility requirements are, and what the amount of the benefit will be. The final place people look to for disability insurance is the federal government. And this is through the Social Security Administration. Social Security offers two long-term and they are only long-term disability insurance programs. One is called Social Security Disability Insurance or SSDI. The other is called Supplemental Security Income or SSI. They both have the same very high standard of disability. Where they differ is that SSDI eligibility is based on your work history paying into Social Security and the amount of your benefit will also depend on your work history and what you've paid into Social Security. SSI is not at all based on your work history. That is a program that is available for people who are considered to have low income and low resources. Um, there is a lot to be said about disability insurance. Um, I would say just as an initial step, if you're interested in Social Security disability or SSI, you can create a My Social Security account on Social Security's website. And by doing that, you can get access to your whole work history with Social Security and see very clearly what benefits, if any, Social Security believes you may be eligible for. We also have a lot of additional resources about disability insurance available through our website. Um, one last word about additional income. So disability insurance is out there as a potential source of income for the person who has become disabled. Um, but the other people who really can use income when a family member becomes disabled are caregivers. Um, and unfortunately, there are limited options for those caregivers who need to take time off of work and want to try and replace some of their lost wages. There are states, there is no federal um, income support program for caregivers. There are some state paid leave programs. And again, just like in the state disability context, each state's program is going to look different in terms of eligibility requirements, amounts of benefits, and length of benefits. Um, the other potential source of some income that a lot of people don't know about is if you are caring for someone who is eligible for Medicaid in their state. If you are the caregiver for someone who has Medicaid, in some states, the Medicaid program offers what are called in-home support services, which means that the person who has Medicaid is able to apply to get their caregiver, even a family member caregiver, some modest income in compensation for the caregiving activities they are doing for the person who is sick. Um, and there's a lot more information that's accessible through our, we have a state law, um, charts of state laws on our website, as well as a state resources page where you can find information about local programs um, and contact information for those programs in your state. Um, I appreciate everyone bearing with me. And I'm just gonna say, just as a final comment and in response to what Lourdes started with, um, if after listening to me, you find that you have a whole bunch of questions and they are of a personal nature, you want to kind of share specifics of your situation, we do have a legal and financial navigation program where we at Triage Cancer provide free one-on-one -on -one help to people who've been diagnosed with cancer, care to caregivers, and to healthcare professionals on a wide variety of topics. Some of the most common are on the slide. Um, we don't provide direct legal representation, but what we will do is talk to you and try and explain your options, provide you with accurate information about laws or programs that are available, all with the intent of um, trying to empower you to take next steps. So if this sounds like something that would be helpful for you, I invite you to 
um, go to our website. There is a brief intake form. Once you fill it out, you'll be prompted to schedule a phone call from one of our staff members at a time that works for you, and we can talk more about your situation. And with that, I want to just say thank you again um, for listening. Thank you so much. Um, if anyone has questions, please go ahead and enter them in. We have a few that have come through already. Um, one person asks, if you're eligible for Medicare, do you have to take it? So that's a little bit of an it depends answer. Um, what I would say to you generally about Medicare is the government has a viewpoint about when someone is supposed to first sign up for Medicare. And if you don't sign up when the government thinks you are supposed to, you may be subject to late enrollment penalties when you do decide to enroll. Um, but the, the question as to whether you have a legitimate reason to delay enrollment and you'll later have a special enrollment period is going to be fact specific. So it would, it would require knowing um, more situational information for me to be able to tell them one way or the other. Okay, no, that's helpful. Um, someone asks, ask, so my Medicare Advantage plan is great, but the hospital benefits are not. Do I understand correctly that Medicare Part A will cover the hospital stay? So Medicare, what Medicare Part A, the reason I used hospital insurance on the slide is just as a shorthand for what most people know Medicare Part A to cover. Yes, Medicare Part A is where if you are going to be admitted as an inpatient to a hospital, you would look for coverage. But in terms of whether or not a specific procedure at a hospital is covered, that's going to, you know, again, like I would need more specific information to figure out um, what's happening. I will say, you know, again, just a plug for this is open enrollment. If you have concerns about the hospital, um, coverage on your on your current Medicare Advantage plan, this might be a good opportunity to compare. Um, I don't know if the concern is about going to the hospital you want to go to versus a particular thing that happened in the hospital where you didn't get as much coverage as you thought you would. Um, but now is the time where you can make a comparison to other Advantage plans or consider um, going back, consider going back to original Medicare. Um, do you have to tell a prospective employer that you have cancer? So you do not have to tell, a, again, I hate to kind of go into the, it depends, but for some of these questions, I just get concerned that maybe I'm not hearing all the details that I need to know. Um, certainly the Americans with Disabilities Act does protect job applicants from discrimination on the basis of a disability, even in the application process. Um, but you also, when you are interviewing for a job, you want to be mindful of, um, I guess, sort of what your concern is and is it something that's going to impact your job performance? Um, such that, you know, you want to have, a, you want to have a forthcoming conversation so that you're not unhappy with sort of how the job ends up. That was not a great way of saying this. What I would say is that's the kind of thing I would want someone to, to contact our legal and financial navigation program um, to talk more about, to see what the root of the concern is. And we can talk more about, you know, like what what specifically is required at various points in the employment process. Okay, perfect. Um, many cancer drugs like the new targeted therapy drugs do not qualify under Medicare insurance plans. Out-of-pocket expense for these drugs can exceed $50,000 per year. Are there any additional supplemental prescription plans to provide out-of-pocket protection for these drugs? So um, Medicare supplement plans only supplement out-of-pocket costs from Medicare Parts A and B. They do not supplement uh, Medicare Part D or drug coverage. Having said that, for those who have been following along in the news, the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act 
is proposing, uh, or I shouldn't say proposing, as passed, assuming that nothing happens to it, um, in 2025, there will start to be an out-of-pocket maximum for Medicare Part D. It's going to start out at $2,000. It's probably going to go up um, somewhat each year following that. I know that that's not a great answer because 2025 is not for three more, uh, two more years. My math is not awesome, um, but it is in the works. So know that that concern, there is, um, you know, Congress worked to hear that concern because it's coming from, of course, many, many people in the cancer community, as well as people with other um, illnesses. It's not immediate relief, but it is coming in the future. But no, unfortunately, um, Medigap plans do not cover out-of-pocket costs for Medicare Part D. Okay. Um, as a caregiver, if I need to take time off to care for my loved one, do I have to disclose to my employer the reason why I'm asking for a leave? So if you're requesting Family and Medical Leave Act leave, I'm not sure, I'm not sure under what rule or law this person may be requesting. Um, generally speaking, under the FMLA, employers have the right to ask for certification that you're eligible to take the leave that you're taking. Um, usually when we deal with people who have been diagnosed, we will say, you don't have to disclose you actually have to disclose your diagnosis, but you have to disclose the reasons that you need the leave. Um, so it might be, you know, I need leave to go for medical treatments and not disclosing the cancer part of that. Um, for a caregiver, though, I actually would need to check on what the exact rules say. So I don't want to misrepresent anything. But again, it's something if you want to reach out to us, we can um, we can look into an answer with more specificity. Okay. Um, what if I had services done, which had a limit, so like acupuncture or physical therapy in my first insurance, but then I had a life event and I changed insurance, does the number of sessions allotted restart with the new insurance? So if you are changing insurances, then yeah, you, you're starting over with, and you have to go by the terms of whatever the new policy allows for or doesn't allow for. Okay. Um, I think there was someone who was clarifying. So if you are eligible for Medicare due to taking social security disability, not because of age, do you have to enroll for Medicare? And that so was in reference to the, whether or not you have to take Medicare question. <laughs> so again, add another layer. So it depends if you, the only way to delay enrollment, let me, let's put it like this. For Medicare Part B, the only way you are allowed to delay enrollment in Medicare Part B is if you have coverage through active employment, either your own active employment or a spouse's active employment. On top of that, whether or not um, you can delay in that circumstance, it's going to depend on whether your active employment insurance is primary to Medicare or not. And in the disability context, well, in any context, that's going to depend on your employer's size. But for disability, what it means is you have to be working for a large employer, which in the, if you're eligible for Medicare based on disability, means a hundred or more employees. Um, if you're eligible based on age, that's a different number. So I, I like to just be careful when we get into some of these specifics, but essentially the answer is, delaying enrollment is only an option for Part B if you're covered by active employment insurance, whether your own or your spouse's. If you're not, you don't have access to a special enrollment period to enroll in Medicare Part B at another point in time. If you are covered by active employment insurance, then I would say, again, you're, you're going to wanna look into the size of that employer because if you're in a situation where Medicare would be primary anyway, 
you still are going to have to enroll because while you have access to that employer sponsored insurance, that insurance, if it knows that it is supposed to act as secondary insurance, um, may not pay out on claims okay. unless you first submit to Medicare. I hope that was understandable. I'm sorry. Like some of you guys have a lot of great questions. It's a lot of different areas of the law to flip back and forth between in my head. Um, so again, I would just encourage you, um, you know, I'm happy to, to answer what I can here, but also feel free to contact us or, or look at our resources. Okay. Um, how long can a person stay on long-term disability? Uh, it depends how that long-term disability is being issued. If it's through a private policy, it depends on the terms of that policy. Um, if it is through SSDI, it is generally, what happens is when you hit retirement age, your disability benefits, it, well, they'll continue to be paid, but basically they get recategorized as retirement income. Um, and so then you just have social security retirement. Um, and for SSI, it's going to depend on how long you continue to meet the criteria in terms of income and resources. Okay, thank you. I think those are all the questions. Thank you so much, Amanda, for sharing this information with us and helping to answer these questions. Um, as Amanda mentioned, please check out the Triage Cancer website if you have uh, more questions you wanna ask. Um, that are a little bit more specific to your needs. Well, thank you so much, Lourdes, and thank you everybody who um, stuck around for the webinar and the Q&A. Um, I really enjoyed speaking with you and I appreciate the opportunity to share this information. Thank you. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Take care.